Yeah, so if the war would be over, let's say today, it will take at least three to five years to rebuild. But you can rebuild material stuff, you know, infrastructure building, but you cannot rebuild people and their memory. And people will never forgive and they will never forget. Something to Chew On is a podcast devoted to the exploration and discussion of global food systems. It's produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University. I'm Maureen Olevnik, Coordinator of Global Food Systems. I'd like to welcome back our co-host, Dr. Jim Stack, Fellow Biosecurity Research Institute, Director of the Great Plains Diagnostics Network, and Professor of Plant Pathology in the College of Agriculture, and Dr. Jeanette Thurston, Director of the K-State Food Science Institute, an assistant dean for graduate programs and new faculty development in the College of Agriculture here at Kansas State University. The country of Ukraine is a major worldwide producer of cereal grains and cooking oils. The recent Russian invasion of Ukraine has put food security at risk for many parts of the world. Our guest of this episode is Dr. Antonina Broyaka, former dean of the Faculty of Economic Entrepreneurship at Venezia National Agrarian University in the Ukraine. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Boryaka came to the United States as a refugee with her two children and is now an extension associate of the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. Her focus here at K-State is on the economic impact of Russian military aggression on both Ukrainian agriculture and global food security. Today I'd like to welcome Antonina Boryaka. She's an extension associate in the Department of Agricultural Economics here at Kansas State University. And a very special guest, Antonina, is here from the Ukraine and I think has a a very, very interesting story to tell us, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. So welcome, Antonina. Could you give us a little background on yourself and a little understanding of how you got to studying what you study and how you came to Kansas State? Hello, I'm Ukrainian, and I graduated from Vinitsa National Agriculture University in Ukraine and I worked there all my entire life and I started as a teaching assistant and I finished with, as a dean of a department of economic and entrepreneurship so that is kind of like equal to college here at the university we just call it faculty or department I have PhD in agricultural economics and I'm an associate professor. So that is my background. And in 2004-2005, I was selected as a young professor, young researcher to be a researcher and a scholar at Kansas State University. So when I arrived here in 2004, I made a lot of uh, connections and a lot of professional connections and I made a lot of friends here and unfortunately when the war started in February uh, 24th I started to receive a lot of nice emails and uh, messages from my friends here in Kansas about what is going on with questions what is going on in Ukraine and how we can help you and uh, could you come here so we will try to help you so I decided to quit and everything what I, and I just left everything what I had in Ukraine I quit with my job and I just grabbed my grab my children I have two children my daughter is 15 and my son is nine. I just grabbed my children and uh, we moved to Poland first. We crossed the border on foot. (laughs) Unfortunately, that was hard work (laughs) to do. 
and then Polish people helped me to get tickets to the US and I flew to the US and now I'm here <laughs> and I really thankful to all people who helped me so much uh, especially from Kansas State University that is uh, people who work currently at the university uh, that is Ernie Minton the Dean of College of Agriculture that is Alan Featherstone, the head of Department of Agicon, uh, as well the people who already retired, but they were on a um, top position at Kansas State, uh, like um, Stephen Graham, who was the uh, vice dean f uh, for for international uh, development, I guess, on College of Agriculture, and Forrest Chamley, uh, who was uh, vice dean for research. And actually, with those people, we did really nice connections. And they traveled to Ukraine, uh, Forest and uh, Ernie Minton, they were in Ukraine. The delegations from Kansas State University uh, three times visited uh, Ukraine and also delegation from my university uh, visited Kansas State University as well. So we tried to uh, start some mutual beneficial projects, but that was hard at that time uh, in, in Ukraine. So, but we made a really nice connection. Thank you so much for that background, Antonina. So I'm curious, at your institution in Ukraine, do they also have extension? And what was your role in extension in Ukraine? Ukrainian education system is quite different compared to American education system. And actually, in 2004, 2005, one of my goal was to study this extension system in Ukraine because it was not really developed in Ukraine and actually before I worked at the university also as administrative secretary of a project that we had within USAID and Louisiana State University on creating extension uh, system in Ukraine. So my university was kind of like a pilot uh, university on this kind of project and that was very successful. And in a few years, we spread that uh, experience to neighboring uh, regions, uh, to uh, two more universities. But unfortunately, we didn't have enough support uh, from the government. And when the uh, funding was over, it was difficult to survive. We still have this extension system uh, in Ukraine, but that is not really similar like here. I've been here in uh, actually in 2005. I had internship in K State Research and Extension. Daryl Buchholz was a, a director at that time, and actually I met at that time Sherilyn Fleming Jackson, very nice person. This woman, she hosts my family now, and I really appreciate that she is the extension specialist now at K State uh, on consumer science. Yeah, and she was working at that time in Raleigh County, so I, I did internship for two months there. So I learned the system not only from books, but also from inside. And when I returned home, I tried to develop this system uh, in Ukraine, and I continued some research on that. Our system, extension system, is quite different, and we have different uh, kind of consulting uh, offices that is some of them are under the umbrella of universities, but some of them are also like private consultant companies. Of course, for farmers who are not very rich, it's more economically efficient and also more interesting to have some free of charge services. And very often a university can provide that. And we, we do some trainings for uh, farmers and for extension agent at our university back in Ukraine. And I was a part also of those trainings, so I did that. Even when I was a dean, I still continued because I, I was almost the most experienced person at the university in this field. <laughs> That sounds wonderful, and, I, and having the experience and being able to take it back and stay directly involved, I think, is, a, is something wonderful that you were able to take back with you and, and, and help teach. Where um, physically was the university that you taught in, in Ukraine? And I assume it was in a very agricultural area. Is that true? 
And um, what kind of, uh, you mentioned that you had the opportunity to go out and work with some of the farmers. Was that something that happened frequently? Did you have the opportunity to work one-on-one, you and or some of your other um, colleagues at the university? My university, the name is Vinitsa National Agricultural University, is situated in the city of Vinitsa. Uh, that is a big city that is the center of Vinitsa Oblast. We, it's kind of like states here, we call that oblast or regions. So that is pretty big university. And as I told, our uh, university system, our education system is different. So our universities are more specialized. We have several universities in my city, and one of them that is agricultural, another it's medical, another polytechnical, another pedagogical. So, and it doesn't mean that we teach only specialities like agronomist or livestock. We, we have different, different specialities. Like in my department, we had economics, we have entrepreneurships, uh, trade and uh, stock exchange. We had tourism and hotel and restaurant business. We had computer science. So I, I just wanted to explain that like specialization of university doesn't mean that that is only agricultural specialities are taught at that university. It means that everything that we teach is related to agriculture, so we try to focus on our educational programs on needs that are more common for agricultural sphere. But but we, we, we teach different specialities. Ukraine is in general agricultural country and uh, 71% of our land is agricultural. And we have a high percentage of arable land and Ukraine is uh, number one in uh, export production and export sunflower oil, and number three of corn production, and number six of wheat production. So, uh, and we produce a lot of agricultural other agricultural products. So we're almost in top ten countries on agricultural production and export within the world. So our university had their also own. Uh, land uh, with some plots and also farms where we farming and some experimental stations as well that we had uh, a lot of contacts and agreements with farmers who allowed us to come and do some research in their fields as well as if they have some questions any farmers they can come and ask us or call us and we can help and answer them questions you were just talking about agriculture and of course Ukraine is an important supplier of agricultural commodities uh, that contribute to both food security uh, and agricultural industries in many nations. And the interruption in exports has already negatively impacted the flow of food, certainly regionally, but probably internationally or globally. So what are the projections for planting this year's crop when we start looking at you know, how long this impact is going to last in terms of exports to other countries. I know we've, we're seeing some freedom right now <laughs> in shipping, but it's certainly an unstable situation. What, what are the prospects for the next year's crop? Before talking about next year, I would like to say that currently we already harvested around 41% of uh, expected harvesting area. So we planted uh, 7.6 million hectares of winter crops uh, last year, but unfortunately we lost uh, a lot, especially on an occupied area like Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk uh, regions. So, and that was kind of the region where uh, winter crops were, uh, especially winter wheat, were concentrated mostly. Also, uh, despite the war, uh, we had pretty good uh, spring sowing campaign. We planted 13.4 million hectares in this year of spring crops. That is 83% of uh, previous year. That is not so bad according to the war condition. And actually, it was almost 95% that we expected to plant in the spring. So I think uh, despite the war, Ukrainian farmers did pretty well. 
and for now it's already harvested uh, 17 more than 17 million metric tons of grain and legumes and also two and a half million tons of rape seeds and actually for this marketing year we expect to have for now, of course, this forecast can uh, change every day because of uncertain situation. Uh, but we expect to get around 69 million tons of grain and legumes. It means that our export potential is very high and our domestic necessity is around uh, 15 to tw 20 million metric tons per year. Of course, now it could be lower because a lot of uh, people left Ukraine. More than seven and a half million people left Ukraine and they're staying in Europe and other countries now. But still, if we will have chance continue export to other countries through Black Sea ports that were unblocked recently, within the year we could realize our export potential because uh, potential of those black sea ports is, is high and even those three ports that unblocked just now uh, Odessa port, Pivdenny and um, Chernomorsk they can export like for now 3.4 million metric tons per month so that is very high capacity that is huge ports, the biggest so if we will continue to do that and if everything <laughs> will smooth, you know, because we cannot trust, especially Russian government. We just worry that the world will just pay less attention to this question and just lose their vigilance. We are afraid that they can catch Odessa because that is one of the main target Odessa and Mykolaiv. And then they would get all Black Sea Coast that actually is their target. So if we will still have an uh, opportunity to continue exports through the Black Sea ports, we believe that we can realize up to 70 million tons during next marketing year. We have very high ending stocks this year, but it's more than three times bigger than on previous years. So we have ending stocks almost 20 million metric tons that is huge it's very important that black sea ports were unblocked now because all our storages you know at least half full of grain and a lot of storages were lost damaged or on occupied areas so from 57 million metric ton capacity from last year we had only 44 million metric ton capacity for this year and it means that we would have huge shortage of storage capacity so unblocking black sea ports is very very important and for now we have already eight vessels left ukrainian ports one of them is successfully arrived already to its destination in turkey and another one on their way to other countries. So they are carrying 304,000 metric tons of U Ukrainian agricultural product that is mostly corn and some sunflower oil, but mostly corn. Well, that's certainly good news. The uncertainty then won't necessarily be on the production side. It'll be whether the distribution can continue uninterrupted and I'm guessing that's very good news for global markets if the uncertainty is linked only to the distribution. Is that right? Yes, of course. We are not only dependent from the war circumstances but also from weather as everywhere. That is agriculture issue everywhere around the world. But for us, of course, military hostilities that is taking place in into Ukraine that is the the biggest uncertain yeah we've seen a lot on the the news of course with the destruction of a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the news is focused on the impacts on global food security what has the impact been on food security within Ukraine since Ukraine 
is a top country of egg export. Of course, that uh, that was a big issue for world society, especially a United Nations work a lot on solving this problem, uh, how to deliver uh, agricultural products to import-dependent countries, especially to African countries. Our biggest importers are Egypt, Indonesia, and also uh, European Union is a big uh, importer of Ukrainian agricultural products, especially sunflower oil. So, of course, unblocking those ports give us chance to solve this global problem of food security and to provide some food to other people. In general, Ukraine is able to feed like uh, 400 million people per year. So we are really breadbasket, not only for Europe, but for all world. So that's why I think this question was so top problem for all countries around the world. And I really thankful to all countries who help Ukraine to solve this problem. But also it is important for Ukraine to continue to be a top exporter around the world because it's not only a question of uh, global food security, but also of Ukrainian GDP, because we need to uh, our economy based on agriculture. That is our main driver uh, of our economy. So that is also important that we have export, and we will get some money to our budget, and we will continue to develop our economy. So following up on that, it sounds like Ukraine is still in a pretty good place compared to, I think, at least myself would think you were. You said you're at 83% of where you thought you would be considering the war. So how much time do you think it'll be until Ukraine, you know, war ends, Ukraine will be back to where it was? I mean, thinking about infrastructure and we've read a lot in the news about, you know, um, even tractors and things being stolen or taken from farmers. We've heard about product being, at least I read just this morning, product being taken for farmers across the border and being turned into oil for Russia. Unfortunately, that is true. And at least more than 650,000 metric tons of grain was stolen. That, that was recorded officially. But a lot what we just don't know, you know, and it's actually difficult to count. And a lot of equipment was stolen, our combiners, our tractors, and uh, a lot of infrastructure, especially railroads and bridges, uh, roads were destroyed. So, of course, we will need a lot of time and money. For now, I read some research on this issue, and it looks like we need 675 billion dollars to rebuild Ukraine. It doesn't mean only a damaged infrastructure, to rebuild damaged infrastructure. It also means that we will need some investment to help business to restart their work, to modernize their equipment and to return people to job because a lot of people left and a lot of men serve for military. Yeah, so if the war would be over, let's say today, it will take at least three to five years to rebuild. But you can rebuild material stuff, you know, infrastructure building, but you cannot rebuild people and their memory. And people will never forgive and they will never forget. So that is also a big issue, the mentality and uh, mental health of people. We hear a lot about the impacts on agriculture, and I was wondering about the impacts on education. So, for example, uh, again, we, we see lots of images of the destruct, uh, destruction to infrastructure and things, and I'm just wondering, what are the immediate and then the projected long-term impacts on rebuilding the education system, from everything from primary right through university? Despite the war, our teachers 
continue to work and they do teaching remotely if it's not possible to do in class. Actually, my daughter finished Ukrainian school here in the U.S. Uh, she was doing two schools, actually. <laughs> One is during the day <laughs> here at Manhattan High School and another one during the night because of time difference, the Ukrainian school. So she graduated from both. <laughs> so teachers continue to work, and uh, my university as well, we continue to work. We, we uh, taught our students remotely. Even some faculties were abroad. Now mostly going to be as well uh, distance education. But I know that some schools, some universities more close to the Polish border, they are going to start in-person education. Of course, a lot of facilities destroyed, especially in Kharkiv, which is known as the, one of the main educational center. A lot of famous universities are there and they've been destroyed. And I know that some universities moved to another city. For example, in my city, in Vinitsa, we host already for several years a university from Donetsk that was moved, all uh, faculty members and some students, they moved to Vinitsa after Donetsk was occupied by Russians in 2014. And now one university from Kharkiv also moving to Vinitsa and they're going to occupy one building of my university. We try to keep our education system because we understand that youth, that is our future. And we need young people to be smart and creative to rebuild our economy and our country. I don't know a great deal about all the aid that's going to Ukraine, but I read a little bit about USAID and some of the aid that they're giving. And I was just curious what your thoughts are and what what the most important types of aid that the U.S. and other governments around the country. So I'll read to you what the three main areas were that USAID is is focusing in on. I'm not going to be able to say half the names of (laughs) the cities, but it's to increase revenues for agriculture, small and medium sized enterprises through greater productivity and market access. Uh, Another goal is to increase access to critical support services, so financing, irrigation, advisory, you know, extension work that you were doing before you left, and to create a better enabling environment through fair and transparent policies and regulations in the ag sector. And so I was curious, do these hit upon things that are really gonna make a difference, or are there some other areas um, that you would recommend? I would say that those areas are really important, but also I know that USAID is working on some other projects <laughs> because they involved me in some years and contact me. And one of the issues that is really important for agriculture, the how to increase some uh, storage capacity using uh, alternative methods of storage and some transportable elevators talking about land market, soil market. Just last year, this moratorium was lifted. Yes, and that really opened some opportunity, but that was a lot of discussion about opening this land market because we were afraid that huge international corporations will come and buy our land because that we have very fertile land that is one of the best in the world. And actually, uh, according to some research, Ukraine owns third part of the richest fertile black soil in the world. Yeah, so that is kind of a very good piece of cake that everybody would like to catch. So, of course, it was a lot of discussion, but I think we did good reform in that issue and we did everything to do that small and medium farmers could get their soil. And of course, we had privatization before. After the USSR collapsed, our collective farms that they were created by Soviets, we privatized and a lot of farmers got their plots. Some of them decided to take their soil and farm separately. Some of them continued to farm together and uh, just uh, getting some benefits from 
their share in this enterprise. And of course, we had some big corporations that had a lot of land and we were afraid that they will become bigger, you know. Yeah, but I think the reform that we made is pretty good and I hope the land market was will work right uh, on a behalf of medium and small farmers and they would be more beneficial. Another issue that really need to be uh, sold that is the mining because a lot of fields just have a lot of mines on them and and we had very a pity accidents when farmers despite everything they just went to the field and tried to harvest and their combines were explode, exploded yeah so that is also very big issue the mining of land and according to some research ukraine now the most mined country in the world especially in the black sea so it will take several years to demand everything i'm curious since you left the university in the ukraine you've come here to k-state to to do work are you still directly involved with the university and activities there one part of the question would be involvement there and are, are there other areas within the country that you're staying involved from a professional or political is probably the wrong word to use, but are, are you able to provide information and trade information from your perspective being here in the United States? Since I left country, I needed to quit my job because I needed to be physically there. If I would probably average professor, I could stay abroad but and teach distance, but as a university authority, I clearly understood that I need to be there physically to do my job but when you have on a scale your job or future and life and health of your children I, I choose my children but I still in contact with my colleagues and I'm not only one person who left you know and I still in contact with my colleagues and they ask me a lot of questions that I support them uh, because I have huge experience uh, uh, back in Ukraine and in education system and on creating educational programs and doing research. So I'm still in contact with my colleagues and continue to collaborate with them. I have a general question. It's because I don't know a lot about Ukrainian agriculture, but when you look at the the large scale commodities, the big crops, how much of that is irrigated and how much is rain fed agriculture? Irrigation is more concentrated on the south part of Ukraine, uh, like Kherson region, Odessa region, Mykolaiv, so uh, more close to Black Sea. It's less irrigated uh, in my region where I'm from because it's more mild climate. So that's why that question that was asking before about irrigation, yes, that would be that will be very important because a lot of facilities, of course, on fields were destroyed, especially on the south. But it's around a half of soil is irrigated, but mostly on the south. In this country, and certainly in Kansas, uh, one of our concerns is water. Uh, for the future of agricultural production. And when we add in the projected impacts of climate change, how does Ukraine look at that uh, combination of challenges for water and climate change in terms of the ability to continue to produce at the level that you have been producing? Talking about Kansas, the weather here is just unpredictable. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> and for me personally, it's also a big challenge to adjust to climate. Uh, so in Ukraine, uh, climate, as I told, more mild. And we have enough water and we have a lot of rivers and lakes. So uh, we actually don't really have a huge problem. Yes, there are some uh, periods on dry uh, weather. But uh, compared to Kansas, it's not so 
problematic as here. What about climate change, temperature? Well, yes, uh, I think that is a global problem, not only American or Ukrainian, that is global problem. Of course, climate getting warmer, but still it's not so bad. And in winter, we mostly have enough snow that allowed us to produce winter crop and uh, snow cover uh, usually that crops enough and we have enough moisture uh, during the spring that you don't need to irrigate. So more dry it could be summer period, but uh, not ev every year, so especially for central region, for northern region, it's not a problem, not huge problem, let's say. Now, one of our concerns for climate change with respect to wheat is the nighttime temperatures being too warm. And if the nighttime temperature is too warm, you're not going to get very good yields. And I didn't know, I mean, when we look at the population projections for the planet, we're going to continue to rely on Ukraine <laughs> to help fill the needs, the food needs. And I was just wondering if there are concerns about the climate impacting the yield potential for Ukraine. To be honest, I don't know what to answer on that question because I'm not a, an agronomist and that is not really my field of study. <laughs> <laughs> All good. All good. So I'm curious, thinking about the work that you're now doing here for K-State University, maybe give an overview of maybe what your priorities are, what your fo where your focus is at your position here at Kansas State. As was mentioned before, my position is Extension Associate, so my main goal to spread as much information, truth information as possible. One of the topic is, of course, food security and impact of Russian war in Ukraine on a global uh, grain market that because Ukraine plays a really important role on this market and also we will do some projects uh, on uh, wheat production with other countries that were part of Soviet Union as well since I have some experience in Soviet Union and <laughs> uh, I familiar, uh, I'm familiar with most of the situation in those countries. This will show a little of my ignorance of agriculture in that region of the world, but the other post-Soviet countries that you've worked with, what is the agricultural impact of some of those countries? From I mean, Obviously the Ukraine is very, has a very large impact. Are there other countries within that region that have substantial impact agriculturally as well? One of the post-Soviet countries, Kazakhstan, it also big grain producer, but unfortunately it is under control mostly of Russia and they don't have a free access to the Black Sea and every, all export goes with Russian control, so that is complications. And actually, Russia has a lot of control on all um, of many uh, post-Soviet Union countries. They 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 cannot control, of course, Baltic countries, and they became a European Union countries. And if Ukraine would became European Union member earlier, they wouldn't have impact on us as well. Belarus has some production, not so huge, but it also under control of Russia. So. It means that all export from that part of the world is under control of Russia. Other countries are also import dependent from Russia, for example, like Georgia, like more than 80% of their wheat comes from Russia. So they also can control that economy, just blackmailing that country. Talking about not post-Soviet Union country, but other countries like Egypt, like Turkey, that have a huge import of uh, grain from Russia and from Ukraine. So if Russia will get control under this export, grain export, so uh, they can continue to blackmail other countries. Most countries 
that export agricultural commodities also import. And I'm just wondering how I would imagine the Ukraine imports food from other countries. How has the war disrupted your ability to import, not just export? To be honest, Ukraine is pretty self-sufficient uh, country. And we have enough production and we produce huge varieties of products that could be enough for our consuming. We don't produce maybe only tropical fruits and veggies that don't grow in Ukraine. But to be honest, I think we can live somehow without some bananas, for example, or pineapples. Uh, several months or <laughs> yeah so but to talk about basic necessity about food uh, Ukraine is pretty self-sufficient so we don't really need import of food maybe meat that is yes for now because we lost a lot of our livestock before and, and now a lot of uh, animals were killed we, we, we are talking mostly about human losses that, that are huge now, for now it's uh, like 5,000 uh, civilian, uh, more than 5,000 civilian were killed and uh, more than 360 children and a lot of people were uh, wounded but also a lot of animals were killed. So uh, of course uh, meat import uh, could be uh, important not maybe chicken, uh, beef, mostly beef. And we had big uh, import of beef before because our livestock for several last years were not so effective. And um, some farmers just quit with livestock production. Yeah, so that could be an issue. And unblocking, again, unblocking seaports will give us this uh, opportunity to get more meat from other countries because for now it's only uh, eight as i told eight vessels left uh, ukraine but anyone uh, came to ukraine with some import of course we we use uh, railroad and roads to for export and import but capacity is not so huge as compared to black sea ports do you have any questions or comments for us? Anything that you just, I mean, that we may not have touched on that you'd like to include? I would like only to ask people for more support because war is very scary. And you, to be honest, you don't see many things that really happen in Ukraine. You can just see a top of an iceberg what is going on. And I always say to all my friends and people when they ask what you would like to add, I would like to add that it's not only our war, Ukrainian war, that is world war. Even if people don't want to uh, name this this way. But Ukraine tried to stop this terrorism and the, the Ukraine tried to fight for world democracy. And if we will not stop it, it will go further. So that is about world structure, about world power. And it is scary if somebody very bad will get all that power. So just support Ukraine. Thank you so much, Antonina, for you know your heartfelt comments and, and uh, providing so much additional information that I'm not sure that we would have gleaned from BBC or CNN or the various outlets. So thank you so much. Yeah, I will add a uh, pleasure to meet you, Antonina. I enjoyed the conversation. I, I would say I, I completely agree with you. I, I gave a talk two weeks ago where I made the comment the issue was food security and how connected everything is. And, and I made the comment the conflict anywhere today is a conflict everywhere. Uh, so I, I completely agree with your sentiment and best of luck with uh, hopefully a, a more a better resolution than, than what looks to be on the horizon. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
If you have any questions or comments you would like to share, check out our website at ksu.edu backslash research backslash global food and drop us an email. Our music was adapted from Wayne Goins' album, Chronicles of Carmela. Special thanks to him for providing that to us. Something to Chew On is produced by the Office of Research Development at Kansas State University. Thank you.